hello. I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, a little background about myself, just uh, as you said, I'm a documentary photographer based in Jordan. And uh, this project actually is one of my uh, main projects that I'm working on. It's, uh, it's the one that I started back in 2016. I came back from Italy. Uh, uh, I finished my degree and I wanted to come back to Jordan and work on a personal uh, project. And uh, uh, what happened was, was I, um, I basically wanted to, to trace and get away from Amman itself and take a look at Jordan as a whole. And you can't take Jordan by itself without taking the whole Middle East uh, in view. So because Jordan is, uh, whatever happens in the Middle East is, affects Jordan uh, directly. So the idea of uh, infertile crescent came to mind basically because of the term fertile crescent and who's not familiar with that term. It's basically a term um, uh, that was given to the, the region because of its fertile uh, uh, environment, uh, the water, the resources, and it, because it's the cradle of civilization. And the fertile crescent was basically Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and that why did I choose for my project to call it infertile? Because I felt that if before we were uh, the cradle of we we were part of this fertility, but something went wrong along the way, and because of the geopolitics of the region, because of the wars, the destruction, something did change. So I I this project came to in my in, in my mind. Uh, and I started to trace the Jordanian border. The first chapter uh, was basically um, going through uh, the south of Jordan and um, uh, covering uh, an important project that was going to, 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 be, to be happening, which was basically uh, the Red Sea, Dead Sea uh, conveyance project. And they were going to drag water from the Red Sea to uh, the Dead Sea. Um, uh, planning to to kind of uh, find a solution because Jordan was considered the second most uh, poor country in water resources. Uh, so that was back in 2016. Uh, and I, um, till now, I'm working on this project. Now I'm in chapter two, which I'll also be showing some work uh, about it. This map is basically uh, showing the route that I took um, what I was doing was basically I took my car and I was driving along where this pipeline was supposed to be uh, um, constructed. And uh, along the way, you have the Dead Sea, you have the history of the Dead Sea, uh, you have the villages, you have the Jordan Valley, rich in resources and farms. And then you reach down to, to the Red Sea. And this is just a small map that I recreated my, myself. Uh, showing uh, this route that I took. Following to the next, uh, this 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 image for me started actually the project because I took this this picture back in 2015 and it was uh, taken at the baptism site uh, where Jesus Christ uh, supposedly uh, was uh, uh, baptized and um, for me that that started me thinking about how dry and how water uh, scarcity affects our land. And that made me do some more connections uh, with, my, with, with how the, the water scarcity might affect people themselves. And this is something that I noticed moving along uh, the border and these villages, because um, uh, water affects us, the economic situation affects us, and uh, what happens around us, we cannot deny that it, it, it affects us. Moving to, to the next uh, slide. Um, going along the way also, these, these moments happened where uh, you, you, you're wandering around and uh, you meet some people and you, you see th certain things. And for me, this, this certain place uh, means a lot to me because and I, I found myself going back to this, this location. Basically, it's a hot spring. And while you're walking in that area, you're, uh, it, it was not the easiest uh, also um, uh, photo shoot at the same time because you're walking around. It's, 
it's really hot and uh, you're 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 trying to to manage yourself and it's uh, and suddenly i see this little girl um uh floating and like happily swimming and i'm like that's so hot how is she doing that but actually there was a a uh, cold current in that specific uh, uh, spot. So I was like, okay, that makes sense because like I'm walking and I can't manage to to do anything. So um, yeah, I mean, wandering around and finding these small moments also, uh, I think added uh, to, to my journey in these areas. And if we move to the next, you have also, um, you know, uh, Jordan, the Jordan Valley in general, and these these shots were taken uh, close to the Jordan Valley and some in the Jordan Valley, is considered the, one of the most fertile uh, areas in Jordan. It's where uh, all the farming and the agriculture is happening. So for me, it's also interesting. If we move to the next picture, let me see what's going on. Yes, so when oh, going to these areas, you know, um, you, you see that there's limited amounts of water and how the farmers are trying to uh, keep on the, the crops and all of that from, from the picture on the, the right. It's just basically a pond for farming. And um, yeah, moving along in these areas um, and trying to find these, these moments, I guess. And um, this picture, for example, is one of the iconic uh, pictures of the project where uh, this, uh, I was invited uh, to this uh, moment by, by these ladies. I was walking also around and uh, uh, suddenly I, I stumbled upon this, this very intimate, uh, gentle moment between uh, this uh, older wise woman with her wrinkles, with her, with her uh, wisdom, I want to say, because um, it's it, she. She it seemed that she knew everything that was going on. For me, I always picture that this this lady is actually Mother Nature, and she knows that we have not been kind to to the environment and to to, to Earth in general. Because ancient civilizations actually used to take care of the of the land more than for for what we see right now. That we are not taking care of the land as we are supposed to. So this this is a small moment that was uh, happening. Can we move to the next? And then these small traditional uh, things that you, you, uh, I found along in the villages where, you know, this is a silent lullaby, I call it, because it's, uh, it's basically there was this baby and the mother was trying to uh make uh, the baby sleep and this is like the traditional very basic from raw materials made uh this uh, the, in the middle of the room this uh small uh, i'm not sure what it what it can be called but uh yeah it's like a hammock type of thing and the baby was falling to sleep so these small traditions also that still uh are maintained in the valley in the jordan valley I felt that they also added something to to this project where I where I try to find the roots, um, the traditions, the folklore. Folklore. I try. I also. I wrote a lot of uh, these small quotes and stories. So it became the the first chapter of the project. Basically, became this. Uh, looking for this area before the construction of the pipeline and. Uh, last year, actually, because the pipeline was not constructed and we were waiting until they were constructed, but last year they announced that it will not be constructed at all. It was cancelled. This project is not going to happen anymore. So this story, the chapter one for me also became like this legend of, of something that was supposed to happen, but it's not going to uh, be happening. So when I moved to chapter two, um, I moved uh, to the north of Jordan. I saw fertility. If in the south that was more barren and there was traces of, you know, um, like we saw the picture of the roots in the baptism site, but, but, but in the north you could see that there were, was water. And that's something that didn't register in my mind. So there is some water somewhere, but we are not taking it or we are not 
we're not able to use it uh, properly, let's say. So uh, also it started out for me uh, to focus more on the concept of borders and why they exist and, and how they didn't exist before and how geopolitics affects uh, how things are managed uh, in our region. And also because I was focusing on uh, isolated villages on the border, it just, it just made sense that, you know, what happens on the border, villages living by the border are dictated by being on this front line. And if we move to the second uh, photo, and we see here, for example, this, this pool is actually really close to the border. It's in a resort in al -Hemme. Uh, it's uh, in the northern uh, border with uh, occupied Julan. And um, it's for me, it was really interesting, the contrast between having, you know, uh, this, this swimming pool, people are trying to, these kids, they were trying to, they're, they're having fun, but they're also caged. And this also resonates in our minds that we are uh, confined in this space and these borders that dictate how we live. And the fact that water on the, the, the picture on the right, it's also a dam that is uh, built uh, on the tri-border with, with uh, Syria, Jordan, and uh, Israel. So it's, it's also that water is a resource that is, uh, it's, um, needed by everyone and maybe someone is taking a share that is not uh, fair and that's another question that was in my research that sometimes that like uh, w there has to be a, a sh uh, uh, an equal part of taking these resources but somehow uh, it's just whoever takes whatever so that's also something that i noticed in my journey um, if we move to the next uh, photo, if also in the north, when I started uh, working on chapter two, I suddenly um, started to see fire in my work. If I was looking for water all the time, suddenly I started to see fire. And that was also during COVID. The whole COVID thing happened. And in my mind, when, when uh, trying to, to figure things out and trying to understand everything, uh, it just also uh, appeared to me that man also had something to do with, you know, the state that our land has uh, reached and we are not being, you know, fair to, to mother nature, to the environment. And for example, the, the picture on the left, it was this farmer that was actually burning his land. And uh, I have read that, you know, uh, this is a practice that is done, you know, farmers burn their land to have a better yield and crop. But like when you when you try to imagine that, like you're burning something that is very, you know, precious for you, very important to you, that that's like philosophically speaking, psychologically speaking, that's very interesting and very you know painful that at the end of the day, uh, we burn the land because we need more from it. And that's something else that, uh, brings out the concept of fire in my mind because for, uh, for a long time I was uh, fascinated by the idea that fire crosses borders and, and the fire doesn't understand man-made borders, it just crosses. So for, for a long time we had uh, there was a fire that uh, used to be on the border from, from Israel and moved to, to jo the Jordanian uh, farms. And it, it, it just didn't understand that there's a, it's a border. So uh, I, I guess for, for me and chapter two really moved in a, in a different direction. Also because I was not only covering uh, the, the, the border with Palestine, I was, I was also covering the border with Syria. And that opened up uh, the, the, the sister cities. And if I can go back to the picture before, I think, is it the, um, the slide before? Yes, with the girls. So this is something that also I started to play uh, in my own mind because this, the, the, I, uh, there was this, the, in the North, there is a city called Ramtha and it's really close to the, it's on the border, the Jordanian border and the, the opposite, the, uh, the sister city, I call it, on the other side is Dara. And as we know, you know, with the Syrian crisis, we have 
so many uh, Syrian refugees that have, have crossed the border. And what happened in the war, they separated these two sister cities because living by the border, sometimes you are closer to the neighboring country than your own capital. And that was something that uh, was very interesting for me. And moving to, to the last uh, slide, it's also, um, I started, I, I was playing with the concept of fire and, and water and trying to, 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 to connect both sides. And I think um, now uh, I'm almost finishing up with chapter two and moving to chapter three, which, which still uh, in my mind still needs some research and uh, uh, a lot of uh, work to be done, but I'll be moving to uh, the Iraqi border and that's, that's a whole different type of uh, thing to, to work on. So yeah, I mean, uh, that was like, just like a, a small uh, summary, I hope. That's the quickest <laughs> summary that I, that I made for this project. I hope it's uh, uh, somehow, you know, uh, clear. And uh, yeah, I mean. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Nadia. Um, shall we move on to Farah's presentation, then we can sort of have a conversation about... Yeah, sure. I just want to say thank you for sharing. I feel like our, the land has so much to tell about who we are as a, like people in our history, and we've been so stuck in talking about things from like the political, I don't know, narrative that we've been taught, and like the land can really say so much about who we are and what we could do. So thanks, and I really enjoy your photos. So um, I will go into uh, talking a little bit about myself because I like to get personal. <laughs> if you know me, that's a thing. Um, so I'll start by giving you a little bit of a summary about how I got into what it is that I'm doing. Um, I kind of got into photography, photography gradually. Um, and when I look back in time, it's kind of very obvious and I think kind of had clear signs, but they only came to mean something later in life. Um, I began my journey with a B international studies and my interest, as you mentioned earlier, growing up between different places. I think my interest in pursuing that uh, degree was shaped by my multicultural upbringing. Um, it's something that I'm really grateful for because it allowed me to experience alternate realities very intimately from a very young age. As opposed to being a traveler, I belong to the ecosystems I was inhibiting. And these opposing worlds uh, or alternative realities, they led me to be curious about the world in a different way. I wanted to understand the world culturally and politically and maybe try and do my part to make it a better place. And that's what led me to study what I studied and eventually led me to work in development in Jordan. I worked within NGOs before coming up with my conclusions about the state of uh, how the development world functions in Jordan. I felt like it was mostly imported solutions and in a way creating a system of uh, dependence. So I ultimately started looking to tourism, which at the time I believed was the ultimate path to self-sustained development. Um, and funnily enough, as I led myself into tourism, it brought me back to photography. Uh, as the language of the century, I had to get acquainted with it and I had to learn how to communicate visually. My job entailed shaping the image of Jordan as a tourism destination. And uh, through that experience, I realized that I enjoyed speaking in this language. It allowed me to connect with humans and sort of understand trends and behaviors through studying images. And at the same time, I was also just uh, enjoying making my own photographs. So I decided to pursue a master's in photography and design at Elisava. And that basically started my journey officially with photography. So my journey began by naturally looking into what I know and what had impacted me. Um, I took the photographic lens to look into my region, the Middle East. So basically, I wanted to understand, I'll let you know when to change this. I guess now we're getting into Badu, so you can switch around there. So um, I wanted to understand how the photographic story began in the region, um, who led it, what shaped it, how it was distributed, and how did that shape what we know today? With the first series, Badu, which you have shown here, I uh, worked with the Bedouin community in Wadi Rum to address the dominant image of the Arab man. 
as it was created on the onset and as it continues to shape the perception of the region and the Arab man today. With this series, um, my goal was to build on the history of Orientalist representation of the Mediterranean Middle East as a vast desert and the Bedouin culture as the dominant culture. I was inspired by the images that shied away from the relatable in order to create strong exotic visuals. Images that were created by Western photographers who had previously been inspired by years of Orientalist painting and basically set out to create what had already been established. I wanted to address the notion of the modern tourism industry as a production, tying it to the early period of photography that limited the perception of the region by portraying it through a romanticized gaze. That early period, I argue, has left us in a tricky situation, which is basically a self-fulfilling cycle that constantly demands the same images and produces the same kind of images and experiences and in turn limits the portrayal of a diverse region and time. Um, my approach, as you can see in the photos, I'm not so great at talking about the photos individually, but I'll talk about my approach to the image making process in general. Um, I like to take a performative aspect while I work because to me it speaks of the performative element that goes into making any photograph. We don't speak much about that dynamic between image makers and subjects as photographers, but I think it's something we all experience while working. Um, and specifically in the context of the tourism industry, as we know it, photography is a key element in the whole experience. And we have everyone today participating in this process and is sort of playing the role of the director. And I think the democratization of the camera um, has allowed everyone to sort of um, play the role of director behind the camera and puts everyone in front of the camera as a performer. So I'm sorry I'm distracted, it's quite wild but out here. <laughs> um, so in the specific context of Fadi Ram, I wanted to speak of the eternal performance of the local community, which is completely reliant on tourism and the role we as experiencers and travelers play in it. I speak of the role of photography and image making and creating and maintaining identities as a performance, something that is stagnant. I think, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think um, my problem with this kind of representation is that it basically freezes time and continuously portrays a very rich region and community in one light. It, uh, it, it approaches um, identity as something that's stagnant and I believe that it's a misrepresentation of human nature because in reality humans are fluid. Time changes, factors change, they reshape us and the communities around us and tying ourselves up in the image of the past is not always the most representative way to approach who we are becoming. Um, and then I guess in the next slide, you have some of the images that I have taken in, um, around uh, the desert that shows sort of the human element or the transition of the community um, of them trying to find a place within the changes. Um, and then I guess we can go to the newer series if you'd like. Uh, maybe can we skip one, two, I believe? So skip this one, the one after? Yeah. Sure. So um, I continued my line of work in also exploring uh, communities that are tied to tourism because I find tourism to just be a fascinating place where many things I'm interested come together, identity, representation, and image making and how they all intertwine. Um, I was looking at the formation of the identity through the experience of the outsider and looking at the image making process that goes both ways. Um, I think it's obvious to speak about the image making process and part of the experiencer, but there's also an image making on the part of the experience, the person who is projecting a desired image of themselves. So I wanted to explore that a little bit more in Petra and see how these factors are coming in play to reshape the social landscape in Petra. Uh, Petra is a really interesting place to me. It's a very special place that I've grown to love. I started working on this project in 2018, but I'd been visiting Petra for six years earlier on. 
And it's just one of those places that really grows on you and shows you a new light every time you go there. It confuses you sometimes, but it's great. It keeps you on your toes. Um, so as opposed to Wadi Ram, uh, where I felt the community was holding onto the image of their past, or what has been portrayed as their past, the community in Petra is a little bit different. Um, Petra being known for so long as the hidden city, it only came into the forefront of the tourism map recently. So they were kind of a bit like secluded, I guess. Um, and they're specific with them. I'm um, exploring the actual creation of, the, of an identity versus looking at what had been created at a time and going back in history and seeing how it's self-sustained today. In Petra, I'm seeing uh, the community coming into its own light and sort of figuring out who they are. On a side note, I kind of felt like I related to them on a personal note as like a, a generation that has experienced different things to our our parents and our grandparents, I experienced like when we would spend time together and hang out and get personal, I felt connected to the sort of like uh, division they had between them and the older generations and their way of life and what they believe and all of that fun stuff. So with them, I'm getting to know them as they're getting to know themselves. And it's, uh, it's a fun process. As, in, as I mentioned earlier in Petra, there are peculiarities to the community that gives it more agency in drawing up its own identity, whether it's visually or way of life, because we're talking about a time where outside influence is not just coming into these communities through travelers, um, but there are also a time when the communities are equally connected to the global trends and influences through our shared experience of the internet. Um, it's a period shaped by a change in travel, mass tourism, and the democratization of the camera uh, that appeared with the impact of social media and shaping experience as well. It just changes everything. I'll take a little break to talk about the images. I didn't really plan out the conversation like this, but I guess this is my chance to share a little bit. Um, Petra has um, many layers to it, and the key like the star I guess of the story or my focus has been the young men because they are the face of tourism and because they are the community that has um, that is just sorry <laughs> it's hard doing this when you're not alone <laughs> okay um, where was I I was saying you mentioned um, photographing men. Oh yeah, the young men. So basically they're the center stage in the story because they are the face of tourism and sort of, um, and within this context, there's a part that's kind of very important to my storytelling process, but I kind of shy away from talking about it because I know it could be sexy and like make the headlines and take my project in another direction. But basically there's a lot of like romance and there's like, what people might call experiential like sex tourism and it's more than that though it's like stories of people falling in love building relationship but there's also like a darker bit about scamming and a whole bunch of things that I would like to get into later on but I don't want it to be the focus of my of my uh, my storytelling process but when I was photographing in Petra I I worked in uh, Wadi Musa in the hotels. I also explored Um Saihun and got to know the people I shot inside Petra. And I shot in, I tried to create like a, a little bit of a representation of the ecosystem of Petra, the spaces also, the inside spaces, the outside spaces, what goes on in private, what's seen, what's hidden, what's layered, all that stuff. Um, and then on a more personal, more personal note, which as I said, I love being personal. Um, I've been taking a deeper look at myself and what I do in every aspect of life and that's translatable in my photography. And I've come to see the personal element to my work that had maybe gone unnoticed um, so far. And um, I was trying to ask myself, 
what pulls me to the desert and what pulls me to working with men because for the last, I guess, maybe five years, I've been working in the same context and with the same settings. And I wanted to mention a few things. Um, as an Arab woman, we know that there are obstacles in being this person that's going out on your own, despite despite the lack of encouragement, or rather, in spite. Oh, I'm sorry. This is getting mumbled. I'm gonna put my notes away and just get real personal this way. Um, so basically, I realized that there is a personal element to my work as well, and. I'd like to talk about it maybe later on in the discussion as well, because I feel like Nadia and I are both women working in a similar context. And I know how it is for me being out there and I can experience, I can imagine that you have similar experiences and people speak about the female gaze and whatnot much, but I think that also it's contextual as well. And as Arab women, we are very discouraged of uh, being who we are in the sense of like doing what we want to do and go where we want to do and not being afraid and just putting ourselves out there. So basically I realized that a part of me has been constantly choosing to seek these places, um, spaces that are very male dominant and that are preserved mainly for men was also in a way uh, me working out my issues with masculinity. Um, I realized that growing up with male dominant societies and like in Jordan, I guess, I mean, the whole world similar, just to different levels, but we're told uh, where our place is and what we're allowed to do and what we can do. And I feel like on a personal note, I've been sort of um, just pushing myself to be where I want to be and sort of like create that space for myself. Um, and along the way, I... I also found that being not afraid and being empowered with myself, when I do end up in these settings, the men can recognize this feeling and in a way um, respect it. And we sort of have a very beautiful space to connect because it's sort of like we recognize each other and we get to get personal and they share a lot of their intimate stories, as I mentioned with the Oh yeah, we can skip the photos. I totally forgot about the photos. <laughs> um, okay. I'll talk about the photos as well. And I guess my approach to, to making these images. So the man to me here in the tourism context sort of represents um, an exotic experience, like a gateway into another world, the past. And, and I wanted to, while setting up the shoots and the images. This was one of the earliest um, trips that I'd been to. I, I had like known what it is that I wanted and I went out to create it. And with time, I became a bit more free and let Petra speak to me and create. Let the moments come as they go. But I also wanted to show things in a very literal performative way of like this man set up behind this dreamy desert backdrop and like a blanket of love behind him and all that stuff. So that was what went into making this image. And then can we go to the next one, I guess? Um, I like pairing these images together because also, as I mentioned with Badu, I work in very performative ways and I wanted to build on that. And I think I will forever maybe work in this way. I like to show my uh, influence or my role as a photographer. So I like to work with with lights and colors and make it present. Like I want the production um, to be a bit clear because to me, every image making process is a production. But at the same time, for example, the image on the right is a more natural, uh, it's uh, the natural tones of Petra. So it was funny because I was in a way inspired by the natural and creating unnatural settings that look natural, but I just like also confusing my viewer a bit where they are not really sure what's happening or what I've done or what is it. But um, yeah, I guess we can go to the next one. Oh, also, you see, that's why I have notes because I always lose myself in the process. I guess I want to talk about the guy's hair. Um, 
which I found interesting working with these men and talking about masculinity. And I also wanted to mention my experience of getting to know like fragile masculinity. And uh, if you allow me now, I'm gonna circle back to my notes because this is actually quite important and I want to translate it as I had it. So basically the space that I created with these men allowed me to take a closer look at masculinity in a way that I was not expecting to. And in the process, I came to know fragile masculinity. Um, their stories of love and heartbreak and the things that they shared with me, they really began to blur the gender roles for me. Because, I mean, it's something I'm still exploring and trying to fully understand. And something interesting that came along this process was seeing how the female tourists of today are falling into same similar behavior patterns as male explorers or travelers of the 18th and 19th century, which were known for their like sexual ex exploits and adventures. And it just made me think of economic power and how ultimately that's what governs human interaction. What is defined as masculine or feminine is really just a surface way of looking at things. And then on a visual note with this photo and the long hair, um, I found them meant to be rather comfortable with many things that are attributed as feminine. They grow their hair out, they put on eyeliner, they have no fear accessorizing, rings, and they're just, um, they're complex humans as we all are. And uh, I'm really enjoying the process of getting to know them and the community because it's shedding light on things that could also be personal and beneficial for me. Um, so, yeah, this image, I think, is great if I can say so myself, <laughs> because it speaks about this, like, I guess, fragile masculinity, and you have a, a horse, which, like, represents, like, strength and all of that, and he's just, like, in this moment where there's a little bit of fear in his eye, and I, I felt like it was, um, a great, uh, way to talk about the unexpected side of my work that I wasn't expecting to go deep into the just topic of masculinity and what it means to be a man in this context. Uh, and yes, I guess that's it for me. <laughs> um, all right, great guys. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I really love that you started uh, uh, or you, you like opened the floor for uh, this conversation about like navigating that space as a woman, I guess, thinking about it, I, um, that is something that like I ponder with both of your works, like how you get so close um, to a community uh, in that way and, and holding the camera to their face, like what, what is that interaction like, how do you gain the trust in order to capture these photos. And especially like uh, Farah, your work is, it has like an editorial feeling, which it, like you said, is a production. And that's something that, um, you know, it, it's it's so choreographed. So how do you get ordinary people in the work to sort of collaborate with you to, to, to capture something like that? And, um, and and yeah, and the question goes out to Nadia as well about, um, about that experience, but. I think what makes it um, special for me is the fact that they are not ordinary people in this sense. Like, if you speak to anyone in Petra, they'll tell you I've had a camera pointed in my face since I was a kid. and Or I've had a photo taken of me a hundred times today. So a camera is something that they are very comfortable with and uh, very familiar with. And... That's also part of why I was building on the performative aspect of the image making with them specifically in the context of their story and and just their experience with tourism and the role photography plays and all of that. I I wanted to show that I wanted to work with them more as like models and collaborators and people who have like this comfort with the camera and can create more and can give me more and want to be involved in the process I mean also it's a fun image making process when we are together I mean we go out scout locations we have music we're just like talking about life and 
taking photos and just collaborating. They have ideas, I have ideas. And I think it's a mutually like beneficial experience for both. And that's why I find that they are willing to participate in it because we're both learning about each other. I mean, I'm learning about them, but they're also learning about me. They have, there are very few uh, Jordanian women who go out into the desert on their own. And I know that they have, they're curious about me as I am curious about them. And um, yeah, we're just like hanging out and making photos. <laughs> I'm curious, do they, uh, like when they see themselves after you photograph them, and I imagine it's, well, obviously it's very different to a, like a tourist snapshot. Um, I mean, yeah. they just think I'm weird in general. So that just translates <laughs> into that. <laughs> What kind of feedback do they give you? Like, are they, like, do they want to keep the photos or do they have critiques for you? Um, I mean, not really. The photos I do share are received well. I mean, they feel like they look like superstars um, in some of them. But also, this is one of the first times I'm sharing, like, these images. They've been in the making for quite a while. And, um... Yeah, I mean, I don't think anything can really, photographically speaking, I, I feel like they're, they have a whole like a portfolio of images of themselves around the world. So um, I don't think anything shocks or amuses. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, Nadia, is that the same experience with you? Well, you're not working. Um, with yeah, I mean, it's a little bit different for me, but I'm really fascinated with the process uh, of Farah because it's it's not easy to, to conceptualize. And at the same time, having this, um, you know, finding the right characters and then it's a collaborative work at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm very curious to, to, to know these details that she just mentioned about how she does it and her process. For me, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, you've seen some some uh, pictures that are basically moments uh, that just happen and you are there so you can't really plan them from the old lady to to the to the girls swimming um, floating in the hot hot spring but then there's the other part where you spend a lot of time and you build access and trust and um, you know uh, for example in in a certain village I was curious to know, uh, more about what was happening in, in one village. They, they worked with wool, they worked with traditional um, uh, things. So I, I, I tried to spend a lot of time uh, building, you know, trust with them and just uh, being with them in their daily life and daily moments. So I think that also gave access. Uh, and then you, you are, you know, they trust you, they know that you're um, you know, they, they're curious also about what are you, what are you trying to do? And um, they want to tell their story. They're, they are also trying to, you know, be part of the narrative. And then you're invited to the wedding. And then a few years later, your friends, then they call you up and they're, you, they know your birthday. So these, these, the, these uh, subjects or these people that you photograph become part of your life. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating how, how you build uh build friendships as well uh, while um, you know it's uh, in your own journey yeah as you mentioned earlier like you said you started because you also wanted to get out of Amman and get to know Jordan and whatnot and it's really such an empowering experience when you do leave Amman and then you start making these connections with people across the country and you feel like you start getting a full sense of what this country is or what makes it up versus just being in the city and disconnected from life it's it is a pretty empowering feeling absolutely for me you know um Haman always took the lion's share of attention you know it's it's always the way where the big cities the capital um uh, does that you know you you know more and and i wanted to know more about the isolated villages because i used to pass by uh going from point a to point b for example for something but my eyes would be looking left and right checking out these small villages on the side and what was happening there so i think that also triggered a curiosity for me to to expand and to know more about you know where 
um, speaking of personal personal work, I do consider, um, as Farah uh, said, that she has the personal aspect. For me, this project, as much as it doesn't really seem very personal, um, you know, in talking about water, man's relation with land, but at the end of the day, I, I, I'm searching for, I, I started the whole thing because I'm also uh, trying to re search and find something about myself, my own roots, my family, uh, you know, where I come from, the bigger picture, you know, the, the uh, am I from Jordan? Am I from the Infertile Crescent? What it's, it's these identity questions. So it's also, you know, these layers and dimensions of, you know, you, you, you start out doing something and then it, it evolves and becomes something something else and uh yeah i mean it's i feel part of the process that you to you work on something and then you you discover these new things and you explore so i think that's also the magic of uh, photography and i'm also working with medium format film so it slows down the process that's something else that i i a couple of years ago i um um, more than more than a couple of years ago, maybe around ten years ago, <laughs> time is flying right now, so that's why. But like um, basically, <laughs> I stopped working with digital uh, for my personal work because I felt it was rushing me and not giving me enough time to, you know, understand the things that are going uh, for me. Uh, going, so so the process of working with film it's slow it's you you need to you know develop the film you send it out and then you come back with the uh, with the material so also that that played a role in 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 um, in my work and for it to be a long term project yeah nadia that's a really interesting point that you bring up about time because i was like um, as i was looking at your work well actually both of your works sort of have this um, element to a degree, but like the landscape is such a, a, a driving force and it's sort of like the never ending subject. And it has this like impossible uh, vastness and it's almost like impossible to capture. And especially like with a snapshot with your digital camera, like there's no way that you can possibly spend enough time with that. So it's, it's a little bit ironic um, because that's the sort of overarching story and your uh, uh, and to capture it, you, you sort of need to spend time with it um, as like its resources are depleted, but then the more its resources are depleted, your project sort of becomes more, there's more to unpack there and it like, it keeps giving as much as it like is losing. Um, and so, I, well, I'm rambling, but I guess like my mm -hmm. uh, uh, question is, um, do you ever see this, potentially ending because time is such an important aspect of it like how how long term can it be for, for sure for sure I mean um we also we always have to give ourselves deadline at the end of the day you know this per this project is a four chapter project that I want to um make a book out of it so um I'm I'm actually now thinking because I finished two chapters maybe I'll, I'll do a, a part one book and then I'll, I'll move to, to the second just because giving a lot of time also sometimes you know everything has a, a time limit or it would be interesting to see the feedback right now rather than wait until you know another uh, couple of years until you know the the other chapters are done but in another sense that why is it interesting that the, the long-term uh, project thing it, it's it may be something that it works for me right now to say that because I feel there's so many things that I still didn't tackle uh, in this bigger uh, title, which is called Infertile Crescent. So maybe it will be, you know, sub chapters or, you know, it's the same. Pro I will be dealing with the same topics, but there will be other projects, you know, within the project. So that's something also that I'm thinking about. And also re regarding time, it's really interesting that, you know, going through, for example, this, the chapter one was shot between 2015 and 2017, but I still keep on going and checking out that these areas because I, I, I just want to follow up. I just want to know these specific area, this specific, for example, pictures. I took a picture in this certain location. I go again and, and see what happened. And it's, it's fascinating for me how things change in terms of water or people don't visit that place anymore or the time of the day. So it's, it's also a process that is interesting for me to keep on, you know, following up and seeing 
what happened to to certain places within the time frame so yeah i mean that's yeah. I mean, I mean, we mentioned like how our work is also a little bit personal and we were speaking about identity and stuff and I don't think either of us is going to like stop taking photos about this, like um, what interests us right now because I think there's so much to uncover, but I'll speak for myself in that I think I feel like quite privileged to have access to such a place like Petra and kind of be part of this process and I think that it's some place that I will constantly be going back to um, in terms of how I produce my work and what comes out, like at what point and when. I think that would have to take a shape or another, but as a place, I do see myself constantly like going back to it. And also as a photographer, I'm not someone who just has my camera on me and takes photos all the time. I, joke that I'm a fake photographer because I don't actually take photos so if there's something that interests me in taking photos I'll probably keep coming back so um and the element of time is so important for me in general like everything in photography it's like my problem with photography as well is or the way it's approached many times is like people go for the visual over the content and it's very easy to like go out and create projects but at the same time it's like time that gives you perspective even if you're still confused and have no conclusions it still like points you in the right direction or makes you want to ask the right questions or it's just depth I prefer working that way so time to me is important and I think that yeah it's just gonna keep going back to Petra. I agree with you. I mean, when you find a connection with a place, it's something that, you know, um, makes you want to go back. And for me, for a very long time, I was attracted to certain places like a moth to a flame. I just have to go like nothing is going going on. But, you, you know, I need to go to see and, you know, so it's it's I feel it's it's part of our curiosity and uh, it keeps us moving. Um, so, yeah, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a final sort of like pondering or question about, um, well, you both mentioned the sort of like alternative narrative that the project tackles and um, and this and these projects will have been like uh, uh, presented, you know, you, you have them on the internet or they've been, um, uh, I think I saw one of yours on NPR. Um, there, there's like a, it's like a sort of open for all eyes to see. So I'm curious about that, uh, the like foreign interpretation or the Western interpretation. Like, do you find that that conversation like informs how you operate or how you approach the project further? Sorry, um, how you approach the project further? Um, do you feel that the, the attention that the project gets is diverted and it's not like not the point that you want to um, get across? Um, for me personally, I have not faced that. Um, what happens usually, uh, because in my in my work, I, I there's geopolitics, there's uh, politics, there's water, there's so many elements that are going on. Sometimes uh, the viewer, uh, you know, they decide what they want to see in the picture. So they might see something. The the first thing that they might see is something is aesthetically nice or something that is, you know, attracted by the light or so. But there's always these different elements that I try to or layers that I try to put in each picture. And for me personally, the difference becomes that one viewer sees one layer, but then you have different viewers that sees, you know, that two layers that I put or three or four. So that that becomes something that, you know, becomes the perception of each uh, person. And it doesn't really affect the, 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 the overall or the core of the project, but I think it's just how people view uh, the, 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 the pictures themselves. So um, like for me, it was, uh, it was not an, uh, something that, uh, formed an issue or something um i agree and like the photography is uh, like clearly something subjective and whoever is reading your photo will read it in 
based on their experiences and knowledge and whatnot. Um, for my first series, Bedu, I actually created that series specifically with a Western audience in mind because I had started this or approached this um, project while I was studying photography and getting into the whole history of photography and just like getting really deep into the whole world and and just looking at photography in the art world and what audiences are actually experiencing this and I was being sort of real in that this is probably going to be experienced by a western audience and I want to speak to a western audience or I want to speak to someone who is experiencing my region in this light and that's why I had like built off of orientalist images and sort of change the approach by being performative and hiding cues within it so I had originally taken that in, in mind and definitely worked because that to me was my target audience I was speaking to and then theory and practice are different and then when you show your work and then you realize that everyone's going to read what they want at the end of the day or what they can um, it kind of I guess frees you up and you start making photos just for yourself I guess and you learn that not everything's translatable and it's it's you can't uh, control people's experience of your work at the end of the day it's it's gonna be what it is thank you thank you guys um yeah i wonder if you had any final comments for uh for one another or if you wanted to move on to a quick q a i think we're doing we have tight <laughs> <laughs> No, for me personally, I, I really enjoyed uh, having this conversation with Farah because we are both uh, from uh, Jordan and basically we, we're shooting, I, I've not shot in, in, in Petra, I've not shot in Wadi Ram, so um, I'm very curious, I was very curious to see, you know, how she did her projects and um, yeah, I mean, that was something. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm also really like happy to be here. I guess we had this thing. I feel like um, we are kind of similar as well on a human level. I can see that you're like, uh, you appreciate time and going back and there's like an honest place the work is coming from. And yeah, that just feels cool. We're just really cool women, you know, killing it out there. <laughs> so, Hopefully we'll have an exhibition together uh, soon as well. So, yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, guys, thank you so much. I think that'll conclude um, this episode of Double Exposure. Um, I think we can follow both of you on Instagram. Do uh, you guys post your pictures there a lot or is it just sort of... I was like taking, I've, I'm trying to disappear off that platform, but I can't. <laughs> I, I, Don't follow I, her. I, I mean, Same no, here, sure. In and out. <laughs> I've just struggled with finding a healthy relationship besides, yeah, I mean, follow me, I'll, I'll find my, my path. It's taking time, but I'll get there. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank much. you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been lovely. Hope you have a great day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>